you know, we're not leaving. We're continuing the, to the next session without a break. Uh, so Chris not only is uh, standing in for the speaker in a previous session, he's an invited speaker. Um, uh, he's a, so I'm introducing him now. Chris is a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Um, he's well known for his work on, uh, on lattices, uh, which he uses to design secure, efficient, and powerful cryptographic tools. His research um, has been really visible and instrumental uh, to the theory and practice of several post-quantum uh, cryptography standards. Um, he's received a lot of uh, different recognition. Uh, he's a recipient of a Sloan Foundation uh, Fellowship, NSF Career Award, a TCC, a TCC Test of Time Award, and multiple uh, Best Paper Awards. And now uh, he's going to tell us about the unexpected applications of fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, the invitation, Sasha and Vlad. It's uh, great to be back in, in Atlanta and at Georgia Tech, and um, happy to, to, to talk to you all about uh, some recent work which reveals, uh, a, a, to me, a large number of uh, unexpected applications of uh, fully homomorphic encryption. So uh, to sort of set the stage, fully homomorphic encryption was this idea proposed by Rivest, Edelman, and Dutuzos. Uh, now uh, 35 years ago, if I'm doing my math right. And uh, the idea is, uh, what if we could say, take some data, uh, our message M, and encrypt it under a key, a public key, secret key, doesn't really matter. Um, and we can encrypt it and that sort of puts it in a box, right? So you can't look inside the box, there's just some opaque, uh, unreadable data inside this box. But then what if we could evaluate uh, arbitrary functions on that underlying data. Right? So you put this, this ciphertext and uh, a function f through this evaluation procedure and out comes now a uh, ciphertext that encrypts f of m instead. And by encrypts f of m, we mean, well, if you were to decrypt this ciphertext, you would get out uh, the value f of m. Uh, and the important uh, property, which is sometimes implicit, uh, but is, is really important uh, for what we'll talk about today, is that this should be compact, right? So the size of the ciphertext f of m should be much smaller than the function itself, the representation of the function. Because one way you could trivially get uh, homomorphic encryption would be to just sort of take the ciphertext, the encryption of m, and just append f to it. And then when you decrypt, Okay, decrypt M and apply F to the result. And uh, so that, that's a trivial way to get fully homomorphic encryption, but it would require attaching F uh, to the ciphertext. So what makes this uh, non-trivial is this uh, compactness property here. <clears throat> okay, so this is, this is sort of the, the canonical definition of fully homomorphic encryption. And it was a long time, uh, it was sought after. This was a holy grail of cryptography that was sought after for three decades. Uh, with no really uh, satisfactory solutions uh, until Gentry first gave the, you know, the first really credible uh, proposal for a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. And uh, this spurred a ton of interest, right? a very exciting uh, result with a lot of uh, follow-up works in the, the years uh, following and uh, lots of work improving the efficiency, the theoretical uh, security guarantees, uh, the simplicity of these schemes and so forth and so on. Okay, so the, the Holy Grail, as I mentioned, uh, and, you know, people had in mind, it's called a Holy Grail because it would have had so many applications, right? People said, oh, if we had FHE, we could do this and that and the other thing, right? Even before we had it. So countless applications uh, of this tool, but uh, I would like to argue that some of these applications are more, uh, more surprising uh, than others. At least they're surpri more surprising to me. So let's talk about uh, these applications. Um, there, there are so many, I won't be able to list even a, a small fraction of them, uh, but let me categorize them into, let's say less surprising applications and then more uh, surprising, at least to me. Okay, so what are some of the less surprising applications? The things that people had in mind when FHE was first uh, conceived of and, or when people were saying, oh, if I had FHE, I could do this, that, and the other thing. Um, so, the canonical story that we tell about FHE is private cloud computation, right? I have my private data, you know, my private photos or emails or whatever. I want to uh, store them on the cloud. I'd like to 
be able to search them in encrypted form or uh, do processing on them in encrypted form, right? So this is the, the picture that you know every FHE talk uh, gives, right? You have Google over here storing your encrypted FHE encrypted data, and it's able to do searches and processing and so forth homomorphically, and only you get to read the results because you have the, the secret key. Okay, uh, a second example would be multi-party computation with low communication. So we have all our parties, they encrypt their uh, individual inputs under FHE, then the uh, everybody can locally compute, uh, well, we send our encrypted inputs to each other, and then we can all locally compute the results of the FHE, and then we uh, somehow jointly decrypt in the end. Okay, so that's just very low communication because we're just sending our encrypted inputs to each other. Uh, code obfuscation is another. Well, you want to encrypt code. So let's use FHE to encrypt code and then homomorphically run the code. Uh, quantum FHE, well, FHE is in the name. So obviously it's not very surprising that FHE would be useful to this. Right? So lots and lots of, of, uh, of great applications, uh, but they, they, they don't surprise you that FHE comes into the picture. Uh, by contrast, uh, to me at least, maybe I just need a better imagination, uh, but I think there have been a lot of unexpected applications of FHE uh, since it has emerged. And I'm going to list these in uh, reverse order, reverse chronological order, uh, and I'll talk about them in reverse chronological order in the talk as well, um, because somehow over the years we've gotten a better understanding, have been able to sort of isolate the key properties, be more modular about things. Um, so the most recent uh, unexpected application is uh, functional commitments for all functions. And this was a work uh, where we had a, a starting point uh, a couple of years ago, and then in Eurocrypt, we kind of completely solved uh, this problem, uh, Eurocrypt this year. Uh, another one was uh, instantiating Fiat Shamir to get non-interactive zero-knowledge uh, proofs. All right, so that was a, a Sub, uh, that was a culmination of a, uh, several weeks in uh, 2019 uh, that finally resolved this uh, question as well. And then there have been a lot more, I'll talk about at the end, a lot more applications like attribute-based encryption and so forth, uh, which also seem somewhat unexpected. So why do why are these unexpected and uh, you know the others are not? Well, what I would say is that in these applications, uh, there's no hidden data. There's no encrypted message, right? Or if there is an encrypted message, you're not actually computing on it. It's sort of off to the side. You're not computing on it. Uh, the stuff you are computing on is, is public uh, information, right? So in FHE, right, the picture is, well, you have some encrypted data and you compute on that encrypted data. Here in these applications, the data isn't hidden. Uh, we're homomorphically computing on public data, okay? Or uh, if we are, in, in one case, we are doing some homomorphic computation on hidden data, but we never actually decrypt it, okay, which is a bit weird, right? How can it be useful to homomorphically compute on data, but then never actually recover the answer? And yet it's, it's very useful, especially in the second uh, example, okay? So that's why I feel that these uh, applications uh, are, are sort of surprising. And, uh, you know, we're not computing on hidden data in these applications, uh, or at least not recovering it, what we are doing is really exploiting the compactness of the homomorphic computation and some special uh, structures of the FHE scheme itself. These are really the essential uh, ingredients uh, of these applications. Okay, so I hope uh, uh, as we go through a few of these applications, be able to highlight uh, why this compactness and special structure arise uh, and why computing on hidden data is actually not uh, needed in these applications. Okay, so uh, let's do some background. And uh, what I'll, I'll try to, well, I thought I would minimize the number of equations, but I failed uh, horribly. So there's a number of equations on here, but if there's only one equation that you take away, it should be what I'm gonna call the central equation, right? You can ignore all the other equations if you wish, uh, but I, I do want you to try to remember the central equation. Okay, so here's the background that will uh, lead us to all these uh, nice applications. So it starts with uh, the so-called third generation FHE scheme uh, by Gentry Sahai and Waters from 2013. And it's been used many, many times. 
uh, different properties of it have been extracted out and variants have been uh, produced. And so what I'm gonna show you on this slide is, is not really probably what the original GSW paper uh, would have highlighted or presented it in that way, but everything I'm showing you is, is implicit uh, in some, some form uh, inside GSW 13, uh, but we're gonna extract it out more explicitly. So uh, here's the main theorem uh, for what I'll call a homomorphic computation scheme. So I don't wanna call it homomorphic encryption because as I say, there does not have to be hidden data uh, involved here. Right? So let's call it homomorphic computation instead. And uh, here's basically what the, the theorem says. It says, uh, if you take any matrix uh, A of uh, appropriate size, okay, and uh, the, there'll be some color coding. So blue here means that it's like an arbitrary matrix. Think of it as maybe a random matrix or a pseudo random matrix, but it really can be anything. So for any matrix A and a Boolean function F, uh, we can compute another matrix called A sub F. Okay, so we just, uh, and, and pictorially, we have this matrix A floating out here. I can take F and put it through this evaluation procedure to get A sub F. Okay. So you can think of this as sort of homo, it's, it's homomorphically computing F uh, in, in mixing together A in this fashion. Okay. So after you've done that, that's sort of phase one. Phase two is that now uh, an input uh, to the function comes. Okay. So for any input X uh, to this function F, we can then compute a, a short matrix. So a matrix S, which has not, uh, not too large entries, pretty small entries. You can uh, compute this matrix S sub F comma X, right? So pictorially, we have this uh, second phase, I'll call it eval prime. It takes in F and X, and it's gonna output S sub uh, F of X. Uh, and and also, also it uses A, so A can be used by everybody. All right, and what's the property? So the property that we get of this short matrix and everything in red means short today, right? So the property is that if you shift the original matrix A by some robust encoding of X, so some way of mapping X to a, a matrix of the same size as A. So if you shift A by X and multiply by this short, uh, short matrix, you will get AF that shifted by the encoding of F of X. So we'll let, sort of let that sink in. What's going on here? We've computed a single val a single matrix A sub F to start with, but then uh, I can apply any shift I like or any, any appropriately encoded shift of, to A, multiply it by something short, and I'll get the corresponding shift of AF here. And the, by corresponding, I mean, it's, it's now shifted by F of X, sort of encoded. This goes for any any x whatsoever. The same uh, a sub f will, will the same a and a sub f will work. Okay. So this is the central equation. This is what I want you to remember. It will keep uh, appearing over and over again. Um, let us see that uh, this okay this uh, central equation is actually enough to imply all of the applications. Uh, that we're going to see, and really all the applications that have emerged since since GSW. Um, for example, we can actually get fully homomorphic encryption from this uh, central equation. Okay. So here's how you can build FHE uh, from this. So I have to tell you how to encrypt, right? The way I'm going to encrypt a message is uh, my message will be X, and I'm going to encode it. So I kind of put it in this robust encoding. And then uh, my ciphertext will be just B plus encoding of X, where B is an LWE matrix. By, by this, I mean that there's a secret vector S where if you multiply it on the left, you'll get something short. You'll get something approximately zero. Okay, so there's, a, there's sort of a hidden uh, short vector here where S times B is, is a short vector. But B looks, is pseudo random uh, under the LWE assumption. So this B looks like a random matrix. And so if I add the encoding of X to it, this A will now just sort of look like a random matrix. This hides, hides the value of X just by pseudo randomness. Okay, so this is my encryption of X. And now uh, let's see how I homomorphically uh, compute F. 
right? So what I'm going to do is to homomorphically compute F, I will just do this evaluation procedure, right? I'll take, take A and evaluate F on it to get A sub F. So I've get, given the ciphertext A, I can compute A sub F, right? Uh, just by applying the eval procedure. So let's look at what A sub F uh, is, how, how, how its properties are. So if you just look at this equation up here, we notice that A minus encode X is B, just move things around, right? So A minus encode X is B. So we know that B times S equals AF minus encoding of F of X. I can move the encode over to the other side. So my homomorphic evaluation, my homomorphically evaluated ciphertext AF, is just B times S plus the encoding of F of X. Okay, so how do I decrypt uh, this ciphertext now? Right? So I'd like to be able to decrypt this and recover f of x. Okay. Well, I'm going to use the fact that this B is a LWE matrix. So I can multiply on the left by the secret key and sort of effectively cancel out uh, B. I can annihilate B here. Can't annihilate it perfectly, but S times B is something small. And so here I would have, if I decrypt, I just do S times AF. That's S times B times the small vector, uh, the short matrix S, and then plus S times encode here. So S times B is small and S is small. So altogether, uh, this is small. It'll, it'll be relatively small. And uh, S times encode is such that it's easy to actually extract uh, F of X from, from this, right? So you can take a special column of this and actually learn what F of X is. All right, so just by uh, do this homomorphic evaluation and then hitting it on the left with the secret key, I can annihilate this part and be left with uh, just this part from which I can get f of x. Okay, so this is how uh, one gets FHE from uh, the central equation. Um, be a good time to take a question now if there are any, uh, any clarifications needed. Yes. Uh, short matrix just means it has like relatively small entries uh, compared to like the entries of A. So for those who know, uh, the matrix A will be like random values mod Q and Q will be, you know, moderately large and the entries of S will be much smaller than Q, All right? So that if, if, if you want more concreteness and you know this, that things, then that, that should be in your mind. All right, uh, good question. Yes, any other? Yeah, little s is the secret key of the, of the uh, which allows you to decrypt. That's right. Yes, good. Okay, so this is how we can get uh, the original GSW FHE from the central equation, just by setting up A properly and uh, AF, you know, saying what AF is, and then this shows us how to decrypt. Okay, good. So that's homomorphic computation uh, in the central equation. And uh, let me just show you briefly, if you're interested, uh, how this can actually be achieved. So we can, I can show you the internals, how this is achieved. Uh, it turns out not to be terribly complicated, uh, but it's very clever. Um, and if you don't care, you can kind of check out for a minute and I'll call you back uh, when you're ready. All right, so how does this work internally? The encoding uh, operation is going to just take each bit of X and multiply it by a special matrix G. I call this the gadget matrix G. So we're just gonna have uh, you know, X1 times G, X2 times G, X3 times G and so forth for each bit of X. And uh, the nice property of this G is that there's an operation called G inverse. You can apply it to any matrix you like and it will give you a short uh, matrix in, re in, in result. And it's also G inverse is, is well named. If you multiply G times G inverse of Z, you will get back the original Z. So this holds for any matrix uh, Z. And uh, the color coding again, G inverse represents that it's a, a short output. Okay. So we can uh, use composition. It's enough to just handle the basic uh, addition and multiplication and, and negation operations. And from that, you can kind of build any circuit uh, that you like. So let's see how to handle negation. Negation is very easy. So <clears throat> my function f is just negation. That's what I wanna show how to do, right? 
So this is easy. I just define my short uh, S matrix to be the negative identity matrix. And I'll define A sub neg, right, uh, uh, over here. So F is the negation operation. So A sub neg will just be negative A. And it's very easy to verify that this equation holds. Uh, just, you know, minus encode of F is the same as uh, encode of negative F, uh, which is the uh, identity function. Okay, so easy to check that. Addition is almost as easy to, uh, to see. So in this case, we're going to have uh, like two bits, X1 and X2, and our matrix A then has two blocks to it, A1 and A2. And uh, I'm just going to define A plus. So if I'm doing addition, A sub F is, is A plus. So A plus is just A1 plus A2. It's the two halves added up uh, together. And so the S plus is going to be two identity matrix, uh, identity matrices stacked on top of each other. Okay. So we can verify that this equation holds. We just plug things in. So this is A minus encode of X1, X2 uh, times S plus. And well, this times S plus just adds up the two halves. So you get A1 plus A2, that's A, pop, that's a plus. And then this also adds, uh, adds up the two halves here. So you get X1 plus X2 times G, that's uh, shifted. That's the shift. Okay, so again, very easy to verify addition. Uh, multiplication is uh, more clever. It, uh, it works out again, and we can show it in two lines, uh, but coming up with these two lines is very non-obvious. So the idea here is that uh, we're going to define uh, A times as the first half A1 times G inverse of the second half A2. And um, so that's what appears here on the right. And I just need to find an appropriate S matrix that uh, will make this equation hold. And it turns out if you just take G inverse of A2 on top of X1 times identity, this whole equation will hold. Um, let me just give you some guidance on that. So A1 times the top half here is just A1 G inverse A2. And that's exactly this part here. So that's showing up as desired. But then we also have uh, A2 times the bottom part. So that's, this multiplies out to X1 times A2, right? And the clever part is that X1 G times this up here uh, cancels out exactly, right? So X1 times G times G inverse of A2 it's just X1 times A2, and that's subtracted off. So it, it cancels away. And then we finally take this last part times the bottom, and that's X2G times X1 identity. That's X1, X2G. So that's what gets uh, subtracted off. So somehow these cross terms cancel out, and you're left with uh, exactly what you want uh, on the right-hand side. So by uh, setting up the, uh, the, the short matrix in this form, uh, you get the central equation to hold. And now you can compose additions and multiplications and negations as much as you like. Okay, great. So, all right, if you didn't uh, follow that, that's fine, but uh, just remember the central equation. And so now let's go and see our first, uh, and by first, I mean last uh, application or most recent application, which are functional commitments. So functional commitments were proposed by uh, Liber, Rabana, and Jung uh, in, in 2016. And uh, their idea was as follows. We'd like to uh, commit to a function. So we'd like to be able to commit to a function, uh, maybe an arbitrary function or a function from some specific class. And so it looked like this, you know, we, maybe there's some public parameter in the sky and you run a commit procedure on F and you get some commitment C sub F. Later on, you'd like to open up that commitment, but you don't want to open the entire function. You just want to say the function I committed to at X evaluates to Y. So you'd like to open up this function at specific inputs. So later on, uh, some value, you know, X comes along and you'd like to open up your commitment and generate a proof that indeed uh, the, the function I committed to evaluates at X to some other value Y. Okay. And to make this non-trivial, we would like both the commitment and the proofs to be much smaller than the size of the function itself. Because one way to commit to the function is just reveal the function. And then the way to prove uh, that the function evaluates, you know, to this, at this X point is to say, all right, verifier, do it yourself, right? So we'd like to, we'd like both of these things to be much smaller than F. Um, 
but still be convincing to a skeptical verifier. Okay. So let's introduce the verifier, right? The verifier should be able to take in uh, a previously given commitment and some proof or a claimed proof that fx equals y and either accept it or uh, reject it. So I'd like to uh, like to be convinced that this um, that this commitment is being opened honestly uh, or not. Okay, so this is the the this kind of general de definition of a functional commitment, and it's got tons and tons of applications. So first of all, there are a lot of specializations that even precede this general notion of functional commitment. Uh, things like vector commitments or polynomial commitments or linear commitments uh, are all special cases of this. Um, and you can use these ideas, this, this kind of uh, structure to do all kinds of like verifiable outsourced data storage uh, or outsourced databases or data structures. Um, you can do things like accumulators or updatable zero knowledge sets, uh, outsourced committed programs, which is a, a paper appearing later uh, in this program. So you commit to a program and then later you can prove that you're, you know, you've applied, you've evaluated this program correctly, or even someone else can prove that they've evaluated the program correctly. Right? So there's lots and lots of uh, applications of this, all having to do with sort of authenticated computation. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the most basic security properties. There are a lot of different security properties that you might ask for, uh, for these, these functional commitments. Uh, we'll talk about just some of the most uh, basic ones that you could ask for. So the first one is uh, called evaluation binding. And it says basically that it should be impossible to open a commitment in two different ways at the same input. Right? So that it's really committing to a function and there's no way to equivocate uh, the, the, how the function evaluates at a certain uh, input. Right? So we say we allow the adversary to come up with a perhaps malicious commitment and a input value of its choice to different outputs it shouldn't be able to prove or shouldn't be able to convince the verifier that uh, f of x equals y zero, but it also equals y one. Right? That would be a, a violation. Uh, the thing I want to highlight here is that there's no hiding required in any of this. So all this information is uh, presumably public, like the function itself could be public, the values x and y are, are public, right? What we are uh, only asking for is that you can't convince the verifier that the function is this thing, but also that thing. Okay. Um, a more relaxed version would be target binding, where we ask for this property, but only for an honestly generated uh, commitment. Right? So someone honestly commits to F, but then someone else tries to open it in two different ways at uh, some value X. Okay. And then uh, if you did want some kind of hiding, you could ask for zero knowledge, which would say that the commitment and the proofs don't reveal anything uh, to the verifier except for the input output pairs that have been proven. Right? So the function remains hidden except at the input outputs that are provided. Okay, so these are uh, some of the security proof uh, properties that can be considered. You can also think of much stronger ones. Uh, I don't mention them because we don't get them, at least not yet. So that's an open problem. Okay, so. What could we do? Uh, what could we, how could we construct these functional commitments? Um, until recently, all of the functional commitment constructions were limited to uh, what we call linearizable functions. So these functions are essentially linear uh, in X, or at least some pre-processed version of X. Okay, so you could sort of pre-process X, maybe expand it out, uh, do some pre-processing, but then the function has to be linear in the pre-processed version of X. Alternatively, if you rely on uh, strong non-falsifiable assumptions, you can get functional commitments generically. Uh, like if you have assumed SNARGs for NP, then you can get functional commitments uh, very easily, but that's a very strong uh, assumption. So then recently we, we uh, with uh, my two students, showed that you can actually get functional commitments for all functions from the uh, standard SIS lattice assumption. Uh, but there was one big caveat here, which is that you need an online authority to help you generate uh, these proofs here. So you need somebody online who's available and say, oh, when I want to produce a proof for X, uh, I have to go to the authority and get some help 
uh, to produce a proof for X. Uh, and that authority holds a trap door for the public parameters and the authority could, can break binding and, and break all the security of the scheme. So it's a pretty strong uh, model. Uh, but then in work with uh, Leo de Castro this year, we've, we got rid of this authority and we showed how to get functional commitments for all functions, still from SIS, but with a transparent setup. So the public parameters is just a uniformly random unstructured string. Uh, it has no trapdoor in it. Nobody knows any you know, secrets related to the trapdoor. So this is about the weakest uh, setup you could hope for, um, and we can get it. Yes. Yes. So that means a uh, different app than the same commitment site. That's true. Yes. So there could be, in principle, there could be two different Fs that result in the same uh, commitment here. But it would be, it's a consequence of the security properties is that it's infeasible to find uh, any two different functions that collide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, good observation. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, what we'll show you here is how to get uh, functional commitments using the background uh, and the central equation that, uh, that I showed you before. Okay. So again, here is the sort of data flow of how we want functional commitments to work. And uh, if you were, you were paying very close attention, uh, part of this picture should look pretty familiar. Uh, any, uh, any observations? Which part of this picture looks looks familiar? Hmm? Sasha saw it. All right. So this left hand side here should look familiar. Okay, it's exactly uh, what we showed before with the homomorphic uh, computation scheme. Okay, so before we said, okay, you've got a matrix A, and you've got this eval procedure which takes F to A sub F, and then you've got this opening or eval prime procedure which takes both F and X and gives you this short uh, matrix S. Okay. So in fact, uh, these two things are, are actually uh, the same, okay? just up to naming variables. So these two uh, structures are the same and, and we can take this and just use it as the left-hand half uh, of a functional commitment scheme and it will work, it actually works. So by work, what do I mean? Well, I have to tell you how the, the verifier works, right? So uh, any ideas how the verification might uh, might work? What should we be checking uh, in the verification? Right? Anna knows. Go ahead. Well, let's use the central equation, right? So the verifier is just check the central equation, okay? So good. When I want to commit, I, I my A is my public parameter. I commit to F by running a val. When I want to open F at a certain value X, I run a val prime and I get this S as my proof, right? And the verifier should be just checking the central equation. So it should say, oh, you, t you claim that uh, this commitment A star, uh, you know, commits to a function where X star maps to Y star, all right? And here's your proof, let's, let's check that this holds. So I'm gonna actually, I should check two things. I should check that S is uh, sufficiently short, and then I check that this linear equation holds. So it's a simple linear equation check uh, and also a norm check uh, on how big, how big S is. And uh, with this, we can show that this actually is a, a binding uh, commitment scheme. Okay, so it's, it's actually secure. I mean, it's complete, obviously it's, it's correct, right? This equation will hold. Uh, more interestingly, it's, it's uh, secure. So we can show that this is evaluation binding uh, under the SIS assumption. So let's suppose uh, for contradiction that we had an attacker that was able to break evaluation binding, right? What does it mean? It means the attacker comes up with some commitment A star and uh, some value X star and two different outputs Y star, right? Y zero star and Y one star, where this equation holds for both uh, with both Y zero and Y one star in this position here. So the equation, both equations hold, right? Just with Y zero and Y one here. And we can just take their difference. Okay, so if we take the difference, then uh, we notice that this here remains the same. This is proof, uh, proof zero and proof one. So we get the difference of S zero and S one star. And then uh, by the linearity of encode, uh, 
the kind of the difference between y0 and y1 goes inside uh, the encode here. Okay. So given these two different valid proofs or acceptable proofs, we take the difference of everything and we end up with this uh, equation here. And uh, now we're kind of done. What we've got now <clears throat> is that uh, we've got like this matrix here times something short uh, equals encoding of a non-zero value, right? Because y0 and y1 are different. So in fact, uh, by the properties of this encoding, there's a, there's a short non-zero column over here. This is a big matrix. We can just look at one of the columns. And so basically we have uh, like a, a random matrix here times a short, uh, something short equals something short. This is exactly solving the SIS uh, lattice problem. Okay. All right. Uh, and Anna goes, eh, I'm not sure because of this uh, A minus encode X star here, right? Exactly. So what we need to do is we kind of pop, uh, program the public parameters so that uh, we can either guess X star in the beginning or ask the adversary to give it to us. And uh, therefore, this matrix would be equal to our SIS challenge. Okay. So we basically said, okay, I can. I have an equation, SIS challenge times short equals short uh, over here on the right. Okay. So that's the, the two or three line uh, short version of the proof. Okay. So this gives you evaluation binding uh, just straight out from the central equation. Great, um, good time for a question if there is one. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so the question is, is there a black box to a black box way to construct functional commitments from FHE? Uh, not that I'm aware of, right? So we're actually using something more about uh, this particular FHE scheme and, and in fact, the homomorphic computation scheme, right? Like kind of extracting out some special properties of it. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, that, and that's a theme of all the applications uh, that I'll mention today. Okay, great, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So from the central equation, everything here is is black box ish, right? Or you you know you do a little bit of linear algebra and you, you you're done, right? So yes, I think from the central equation you can recover. I think all the applications that I'll mention by just setting up the matrices in the appropriate way. Yes. Uh, a question there. Yes. How large is how large is CF? Yeah, right. So if F, uh, let's say F outputs a single bit then a CF is just a matrix that's the size of G. So it's sort of a fixed size. So it's, um, it's linear in the output uh, length of F, but not, it does not depend really in any essential way on the size of F as a circuit. Yeah, just the output length of F. Great. Okay, so let's go on. Um, there's some nice bonus features of this, which I'll just mention is that, you know, the specializations to vector commitments and polynomial commitments and so forth, um, due to the form of these uh, kinds of commitments, you can do pre-computation and exploit linearity to get a much more efficient uh, versions of this commitment scheme. Um, so it just sort of says you can write the function f uh, using its lookup table as a weighted sum of uh, EQ uh, equality tests. And so by pre-computing all these equality tests, you can sort of do that once and then commit uh, to as many uh, different, you know, lookup tables or polynomials as you like. Uh, you can also do stateless updates. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't say more about that. But you can also get zero knowledge if you relax the binding property a little bit uh, by using what's known as uh, circuit privacy or eval evaluation privacy. So this a sub f here can actually hide the function f, right? Reveal nothing about the function f. And then when you open, you can also make it so this s here doesn't reveal anything uh, apart from the input output uh, XY relationship. Right? So you can get a zero knowledge version of this, which actually does hide uh, F and, and other information. Okay, so that's uh, final thoughts on functional commitments. So unlike in FHE, everything we've seen here, there's no hiding needed and there's no structure to any of these matrices needed. There's no need to have a secret key embedded in it or anything like that. Uh, the public parameter is just an unstructured random matrix. The function f and x are, are all public. 
Um, and so this doesn't look very much like FHE, but it, it, it is homomorphic computation and it has arisen from an FHE scheme. Um, as I've said before, compactness is really the, the critical feature, right? We get one small A sub F or C sub F if you like, uh, but it supports many different openings or many different solutions uh, to this central equation for all the X's uh, in the domain of the function. Okay. Uh, I should also mention there's a concurrent work by Wee and Wu, which also gets functional commitments with uh, very different properties. Uh, they have a structured uh, random string, so there's a private private key setup. Uh, the burden of computation is swapped, so the prover does little work, but the verifier does a lot of work. Uh, that has smaller proofs, and it's based on a, a new ad hoc uh, assumption uh, that needs cryptanalysis. Uh, but still, still, I think you can probably write down their scheme as a arising from the central equation. Okay, so let's move on to uh, a second surprising application, which is instantiating fiat Shamir to get non-interactive zero knowledge. Okay, so uh, zero knowledge and, and non-interactive zero knowledge. So first of all, zero knowledge is usually conceived of as an interactive protocol between prover and verifier. And uh, a central theorem uh, or two theorems about this is if one-way functions exist, then every NP language has uh, a zero knowledge proof or a zero knowledge argument. Uh, well, both a proof and an argument, uh, depending on what the, the protocol is. Um, so that's if you allow interaction, the, the problem is essentially solved. The one way functions are uh, sufficient and arguably necessary to get zero knowledge for NP. But interaction is not desirable. We don't like a lot of back and forth, right? So uh, the question asked by Blum, DeSantis, McCallie, and Persiano in 88 was, what if the prover could just send a proof over to the verifier and the verifier would check it? Okay, is this possible? Can we get zero knowledge uh, for this? Well, in the plane model, where it's really just a proof going over, uh, you can't prove anything uh, non-interactively that you can't prove, the verifier can't do himself. So it's a trivial, the, the languages that you can prove in non-interactive non zero knowledge are just the trivial languages. But if you allow a random string or a reference string to be chosen, then uh, every NP language has a non-interactive zero knowledge protocol under various cryptographic assumptions. So these assumptions are like trapdoor permutations or pairings or indistinguishability obfuscation. Um, so specific specific assumptions, not like general one-way functions. That's still not known. And a question uh, that we were asking in 2008, uh, when we were looking at a lot of these applications, are like, can we get NISX for NP under lattice assumptions? And uh, for a long time, we couldn't do it. We tried a lot of different things and just uh, nothing was working. Uh, but then in 2019, uh, building on this, these works related to Fiat Shamir, uh, finally, this was uh, resolved. So a, a major step uh, toward it by Kennedy et al. And then uh, with my student, Sina Sheehan, we finally got the last piece of the puzzle to assume LWE, uh, NISICs are possible for all of NP. Okay, so I'd like to show you a flavor of how uh, this result works and why homomorphic uh, computation is uh, central to it. So the way this works is going, is going to be via Fiat Shamir. So Fiat Shamir is a transform that allows you to remove interaction from a public coin protocol using a hash function. So suppose you have some protocol where the prover sends a message, the verifier sends random bits, the prover sends something, verifier maybe sends more random bits, and eventually the verifier accepts or rejects. You can make this non-interactive by uh, putting a hash function you know, in the sky, and uh, saying, instead of the verifier choosing random bits, we'll just hash all the prior uh, messages from the prover and treat those as if they were the random bits given by the verifier. Okay. So the prover can kind of act as the verifier on its own locally, and then just send the whole proof over in one, one pass. So uh, it's relatively easy to show that if your original protocol is complete, and zero knowledge, then uh, this version can also be complete and zero knowledge. Uh, it's not too hard to, to argue this. 
But the hard part of the fish mirror is soundness, right? So soundness being if the statement is false, right? If you're trying to prove a false statement, the prover will be caught with very high probability over here. But if the prover is trying to prove a false statement over here, maybe can it rig up, you know, some special message alpha that hashes just the right way so that it can complete the full proof and convince the verifier. So proving soundness is really the, the key difficulty. Uh, that is, are there some, you know, prover messages alpha and gamma such that alpha hashes to just the right uh, just the right value that lets the prover complete the proof. Okay. Um, and can a cheating prover actually find such values? Okay. So this is the question of, is it a proof or is it an argument? Does it sound against an unbounded prover? Does it sound against a computationally bounded prover? You can ask both questions. Okay, so the hard part of fiat Shamir is soundness. And uh, starting with uh, Kalai Ruff and uh, Ruff and Lothbloom in uh, 17 and, and many subsequent works, uh, there was a lot of progress on addressing this question. So uh, what was uh, observed is that a, what's called a correlation intractable hash function uh, can often suffice to make fiat Shamir sound. So what does correlation intractable mean? It means that if you choose a hash function at random from this special family, then it's hard or maybe impossible to find an input alpha so that A and the hash of alpha is in some certain relation. What is that relation? It's the relation of uh, alpha beta pairs that have a, you know, a, a way to complete the proof to fool the verifier. Okay. So just not really saying anything here, just syntactically, this is just another way of stating the soundness condition that we want, right? We want it to be hard, to find an alpha whose hash beta uh, allows the proof to be completed. Okay. So uh, a theorem that was shown more, more precisely, actually more concretely uh, by Holmgren and Marty and then Kennedy et al, is that we can get uh, NISIC proofs for any NP language if we have a correlation intractable hash family for all bounded circuits. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that if you choose a hash function from the family at random, then you can't find an alpha such that H of alpha equals C of alpha, where C is any circuit up to a certain size. So importantly, you have to fix the family first. Okay, you fix the family script H, and then you say, all right, now I, uh, I want this circuit C, this particular circuit C, um, and if I choose a member from the family, from the hash family, it should be hard for me to make H of alpha equals C of alpha. Okay. So this is the theorem that they proved. And the kind of proof idea, the idea, key idea why this suffices is that uh, if you take, for example, the, the classic Hamiltonian cycle uh, protocol, every message that the prover sends, every alpha that the prover might start with, there's exactly one beta that will let the prover complete the proof. Okay, so we can call this the fooling challenge or something like that. So it's, there's a single value beta that uh, will let the prover fool the verifier. Okay. If any other beta is chosen, the prover will be caught uh, lying and the verifier will reject. Okay. So there's exactly one fooling challenge beta. And moreover, this fooling challenge actually can be computed from alpha uh, using a trapdoor for the um, uh, the trapdoor that for a value that's up in the common random string. Right? So there is a secret circuit that has a secret key in it uh, that will tell you what the fooling challenge is. So no matter what uh, what alpha is sent, there's a secret circuit that will tell you what the fooling challenge is. Right? And so if your hash family is collision intractable for that circuit, well, that means there's no way for you to come up with an alpha that hashes to the fooling challenge. So very lovely, uh, very lovely argument here. Uh, but the bottom line is we just need a CI family for all bounded circuits. Okay. Once we have that, we can get NISX for NP. So uh, that's what was obtained uh, in a, a long series of works under various assumptions, ultimately SIS uh, or LWE. So we can get a correlation intractable hash function for all bounded circuits. 
using this homomorphic computation under SS and LWE. And there's kind of two different modes. One is uh, based on SIS. And it says that it's hard to find uh, you know, a, a collision uh, correlation. It's find, hard to find a correlation. And so this will give you a argument, right? It'll be sound against a computationally bounded prover, and it'll be statistically zero knowledge uh, under a random string. Or you can flip it and get uh, something where even there does not exist an alpha that breaks this correlation tractability. Doesn't exist. So even an unbounded prover uh, can't find it because this alpha doesn't exist. Um, so this gives you a uh, computationally zero knowledge proof if you have a structured random string that uh, is an LWE matrix. Okay, so let me give you uh, the, the sort of one slide description of how this hash function works. Um, it's, it's quite simple once you, once you see it. Of course, it wasn't simple for a long time. So we want to have correlation and tractability for size S circuits. And let's pretend that the circuit outputs a, a vector, okay, a vector of values. My hash key is going to be just a uniformly random matrix A, and this A will be big enough that it can hide a description of the circuit uh, or an encoded description of the circuit, as we'll see. So think of this A as maybe having the circuit hidden inside of it, maybe, maybe not, right? But you don't know what if it has a circuit in it or what circuit is in there. All right, so how do we evaluate this hash function? Uh, I'm given some input alpha, and I'm just gonna evaluate, uh, I'm gonna do homomorphic evaluation on uh, a special function U sub alpha. This U sub alpha basically flips code and data. So it's a universal circuit. Um, if I call U sub alpha on a circuit, it will output C of alpha. Okay, so the, the clever idea here is to swap code and data. We're now evaluating uh, this universal circuit that has alpha hard-coded into it. Okay, so we get this A sub alpha out. And then the second thing we're going to do is like flatten or inertify, uh, is what I call it, this matrix A. Um, oops, that should be A sub alpha, sorry. So we're basically going to take A sub alpha times a, a single short vector, and so we'll get a vector out uh, as output. And this is a special vector that has the property that if you take an encoding of any y times this short vector, it will give you back uh, the vector y. So this short vector is easy to easy to design. And our output is just this. Right? So our hash function just homomorphically evaluates this uh, universal circuit with a hard coded into it, and then kind of basically picks out uh, one one random column uh, of the result. Not a random column, I'm sorry, a special column uh, of the result. Okay, so uh, the key point here is that the output of our function is a vector, and it's a vector that's the same size as the circuits that uh, we want to be intractable for. Okay, so this A sub alpha can effectively hide a circuit uh, or circuit output rather of the same size. And this allows us to actually mix together these values or cancel them out. So we're sort of comparing the uh, commitment and the value that it commits to and treating them as uh, mixable, okay? So that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but the next slide will explain that, yes. This is any, uh, this is any value Y. So no matter what Y is, Right, so you can think of think of this y as, as as representing C of alpha, right? In the in the security proof, C alpha will be uh, hidden in here, and uh, we're going to hit it with this short vector, and that will output C alpha as a vector itself. Okay, so just to uh, give you an idea of the the proof. Okay, so why is this correlation intractable? Again, our hash key is just a random matrix and evaluation looks like this. So we do eval to get uh, A sub alpha and then we multiply by this one short vector. So suppose you have a circuit C and suppose you have some adversary that violates correlation and tractability, right? So what does it mean? It means that the adversary was given this hash key and was able to find an alpha such that H alpha equals C of alpha. 
right? That's what it means to break correlation and tractability. What we'll show is that uh, we can use this alpha to solve SIS. So we can use this adversary to solve SIS. So the observation is that um, this adversary works, you know, given this random hash key, but we could have hidden the circuit of interest in, in this hash key, right? Instead of using A, we could have used a uniform B plus uh, an encoding of the circuit in question, right? And this, this B is uniform, so overall the distribution of A is still appropriate, still random, right? uniformly random as it should be. Okay, so imagine that this hash key actually holds this encoding of, of the circuit. And now let's just use the central equation, okay? So uh, we are going to derive our short matrix, you know, using eval prime here. So we have our function, we have our input, we just derive this. So by the central equation, we know that uh, A minus encode of C, that's B, times S uh, equals A minus encode of C times S. Okay, so I just did a substitution here. Uh, so this is just substitution of what B is. B is A minus encode of C. But by the central equation, this term here, A minus encode of C times the short uh, matrix equals A alpha minus encode of C alpha. Okay, so that's the central equation. And then uh, we've also multiplied by this, this inerting uh, or this flattening matrix, uh, sorry, flattening vector. And by design, A alpha times S star is just little a alpha, but also encode of anything times S star is just uh, the encoded value. Now, by assumption, the hash value, the hash output, which is A alpha, equals C alpha. So this is all zero. Everything cancels out. The value, uh, the, 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 the homomorphically encrypted value equals the value that's inside of it. And somehow we've arranged for them to cancel each other out. And that gives us zero. So this, in fact, solves SIS uh, on the matrix, on the random matrix B. So if our, our, we can set things up so that our B is our SIS uh, challenge, we set up our hash key to be B plus in code of C, and everything just falls out. Okay, so that's a lot, uh, too many equations, right? But um, hopefully that gives you the flavor of well, what's going on here. All right, you can also uh, tweak this so that if you make B uh, an LWE matrix instead of a uniformly random one, you can actually make this impossible. So there just does not exist an alpha where the hash of alpha equals C of alpha, right? So there's a little tweak. Maybe I'll leave that as an exercise to uh, see if you can work that out. Okay, great. So, uh, or I, rather, I'll, I can take a question here uh, or I can uh, wrap up. Well, let me see if there's a question first. Yes. It's uh, it's incomparable, I think, to things like uh, to collision resistance. Um, you know, in this case, it's not that strong because we can base it on SIS, which is a, a pretty mild assumption. Um, but yeah, in general, I mean, it seemed three years ago that correlation and tractability was completely, you know, very difficult to obtain. Uh, but now, now we know that we can get it from pretty mild assumption. Right, so it's for it's for a class of circuits uh, in this case, right? So the correlation and tractability is for class of size S circuits. And the way it goes is the adversary picks a circuit from that class, is given a random hash key and cannot make H of alpha equals C of alpha. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If, if it's just for a single circuit, it's trivial to achieve and it's not interesting, yeah. Okay, so, so final thoughts on uh, CI hashing. Um, in the security proof that I outlined, the hash key is hiding a, a trap door. It's, it's holding a, hiding a secret key that homomorphically lets us compute the fooling challenge of the zero knowledge protocol. Okay, so it allows us to kind of decrypt this alpha and, and compute the fooling challenge. 
And uh, what's interesting is this is another example of uh, homomorphic computation of a decryption function, which was originally showing up in the, the classic bootstrapping uh, FHE technique. Um, so here's another appearance of the, that kind of idea. Uh, the other thing, in this construction, there is hidden data, right? The, the circuit is sort of hidden inside the hash key, and we homomorphically compute that circuit, you know, under the covers, uh, but it's somehow never opened, which is weird. But uh, the correlation and tractability says that just breaking correlation and tractability makes the outer value equal the inner value, and this itself is, is infeasible to do. So you never have to actually decrypt anything in this construction. Uh, so that's the cancellation. Um, and then I'll wrap up with just a couple more mentions of, uh, or maybe more than a couple other applications of these ideas that you can get by applying the central equation uh, in different ways. So attribute-based encryption, uh, there's homomorphic computation here, but it's on public attributes and public policies. So there's nothing hidden going on, but uh, whether you can decrypt or not is related to the public evaluation of these uh, computations. Uh, predicate encryption actually does hide the attributes, uh, and there's two layers. So there's encrypted attributes, which are public, and those are computed on homomorphically. And then anyway, it's very, very complicated and, and uh, clever. Um, but again, homomorphic computation on public attributes. Uh, fully homomorphic signatures. Again, these are doing homomorphic computation, but again, it's on the public signed data. There's no secret uh, data that's uh, being homomorphically computed on. Um, and then there are PRFs, which are privately constrained. And again, there's homomorphic computation on the public PRF inputs according to a policy of whether you should be able to evaluate or not evaluate uh, the PRF at this input. Okay, and then uh, your next great idea will also use this because now you know how it's done. Okay, so thank you for your attention and uh, let's have lunch. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, Chris asked uh, throughout the talk if there are questions, but let's see if there is questions now. Yes. yes. Yes, yeah, so on the slide well, back here, um, yeah, we did it in about a quarter of a slide right here, right. yeah, so this blue, this blue tells you, yeah, so I think this, I think the central equation is strong enough to uh, give you all the applications I mentioned if you just set up the matrices correctly. In some, in some sense, I think so, yeah. And I, again, this, is, this has always been going on in the internals of the GSW scheme. It just took some uh, time to abstract and, and uh, extract these properties out uh, so that they can be modular. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I also don't know how to spell parallelopiped. Uh, P A R E L L E. Uh, okay, so ding, right? I lost the spelling bee. Uh, yeah, I think that with this, you probably could could start doing. You know, um, maybe you can do anonymous credentials using using uh, this kind of abstraction. I hope so. Let's see. Let's see. Yes. The proof sizes for the, so yeah, the functional commitments. Um, so it's not a snark actually, uh, because uh, it doesn't have um, uh, knowledge. Uh, we don't have knowledge properties from this, uh, but it is, it's very related sounding to snarks, right? Um, so the proof here, is just this uh, matrix S. And the dimensions of this S, the height is uh, linear in the length of X, the input X. And the width of S is uh, linear in the output length of Y. So basically it's, it's length of X times length of Y uh, in size. So 
fairly big, but uh, in but but independent of the function complexity, uh, and so it's smaller than the function in that sense. Yes. Yes. Um, in many cases, you don't have to exist. Can you bypass bootstrapping in an FHE? Uh, do you mean or? Oh yes, yeah, yes. Um, almost all these applications that I mentioned, uh, the detail in detail, and also all of these, uh, almost all of them do not use bootstrapping, or at least do not need to. Um, I think that predicate encryption arguably does have a have bootstrapping like operations going on, uh, but um, the rest of these don't don't really need it. They, they may benefit from it as an optimization, uh, but they don't need it. In fact, uh, what I should say is a big open problem is to get a bootstrappable version of the central equation. Because in many cases, uh, they don't need bootstrapping, but they benefit from it. And I don't know how to introduce bootstrapping into a lot of these applications. So that would be terrific. Uh, it would be very beneficial. Good question. Okay, so I think now we're uh, we're done. Thanks, uh, thanks again, Chris. Thank you all.